a number of states, including Florida, are, are trying to get uh, ballot measures like you had in Michigan uh, through to guarantee abortion rights in, in their state. What happens if Donald Trump's threat or promise, depending on how you see it, to impose a 15-week abortion ban comes to pass? Does that, does that have more strength than your state's uh, guarantee? Well, listen, I think one of the things with a guy like Donald Trump is you got to watch what he does. Don't listen to what he says. He says a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, he's the one that put three Supreme Court justices on the bench who took, you know, who overruled Roe v. Wade. And it is exactly why we have a patchwork of rights across this country, why reproductive freedom is under attack. So as we look to what may happen in Florida and what may happen in Arizona, let's be very clear. Abortion is on the ballot in mm -hmm. all 50 states in this election. If Donald Trump becomes our, our president again, he is going to eviscerate many fundamental freedoms, including the right to abortion. And it would impact women in Michigan, New York, California, and every other state. State like Ohio that has achieved, you know, protections for this right. And in the last election in your state, uh, you and your your fellow statewide Democrats leaned into that as an issue and other issues, obviously. Um, it, it is the prototype, perhaps, for what can happen across this country in November. Absolutely. You know, Ellie, I was, um, I had to tell my story about being sexually assaulted when I was at Michigan State in undergrad uh, 10 years ago when I was fighting an effort to make it even harder for women to access abortion. It didn't change a single vote that day. But I knew after the response that I heard from people across Michigan that we were right on this issue. 10 years later to the day, I mm -hmm. uh, was able to sign the repeal of that very law. This is a fight we are, we women in America and our families and our allies are ready to have. We shouldn't have to. It is horrifying that we are in this moment, but I don't think anyone should underestimate American women and how strongly we and men and allies across this country feel about this issue, and we are going to win on it. One of the things you did in that speech um, a decade ago when you were the minority leader in the Senate, you said you didn't really, you don't like talking about this that much, but you, you wanted people to see who the women were on the other side of the story, on the other side of the equation. And we have learned that since the fall of Roe, right? These abstractions about women who get abortions uh, have now become real stories about women who are actually dying in the effort to, to have reproductive health care. Well, that's right. And when I told that story, it didn't sway a single vote that day. And sadly, you know, as I just signed into law, you know, this repeal of the ban on paid surrogacy in Michigan, we want to help women and their families, you know, same-sex couples as well, start a family in whatever way makes sense for them, on their own terms, when and when they're ready. We can protect all of those rights. But this, um, this bill that I just signed into law yesterday only had two Republicans vote in favor of it. This is the same mm -hmm. group of people that said, oh, we all support IVF when the mm -hmm. Alabama ruling came out. But then when they had a vote in front of them to protect IVF and to protect surrogacy, they voted no. No. And so that's why I keep saying, watch what people do. Don't listen to what they say. Mm -hmm. Watch what they do, and that's who, they'll tell you who they are. The, the IVF issue in Alabama, uh, and I'm glad you have straightened this out in Michigan, but it confused many of us because we didn't really understand what, what, what's this about? Why are people against IVF? Most people just think IVF is, is difficult and expensive um, and hard to achieve, but it helps people uh, who are trying to have children. What, what does your law in Michigan now protect against? Well, so we have secured and, and made very clear what the rights are and codified IVF, as well as uh, decriminalized paid surrogacy. I think those were two very important ways that many people create families. And we want to ensure that if you want to have a family, you're ready to have it, you've got all the avenues to do exactly that. You, when, if an embryo is considered a, a human being, has rights of a human being, that means, you know, IVF, of course, you saw what happened in Alabama, but also also could extend to embryonic stem cell research. It could ban the cutting edge research for cures when it comes to Alzheimer's or juvenile diabetes. I mean, this is a really scary moment. And if people are really paying attention, you see how broad all of these attacks could be applied. And it is why this fight is so important and why we've all got to be a part of it.
Donald Trump uh, said a lot of things in Michigan that are of interest, including how the country is going to cease to exist if he's not president and um, our, our death to our cities and our suburbs and all this. He also pointed out that suburban housewives uh, love him. He made that made it very specific. He was talking about suburban housewives. Uh, this is always a discussion that comes up. If you are from Michigan. Your victories were across the board in urban areas and suburban areas. And on these issues of reproductive rights and freedoms in general, um, it seems to cross a lot of those uh, those those lines. I, I suspect there are some suburban housewives in Michigan who are kind of annoyed that Donald Trump is invoking them uh, for nonsense that they wouldn't support. Well, I sure as heck would be. I mean, we know that the hardworking women and men of this state spoke loud and clear in the last election and sent me back to keep doing this job. And I'll tell you, you know, it, I think that the conversation around our border is serious. We need serious leaders who are going to try to solve problems. Donald Trump couldn't get it done when he was president. He called me and asked me to send the Michigan National Guard, and we did. We performed some surveillance on the southern border to help him out. He couldn't get it fixed. And so when Joe Biden was on the precipice of working with Congress mm -hmm. to finally have some real protections, he's the one that torpedoed it. And so to come into this state and to, to tell people that he was the one that could have fixed it when it's exactly Exactly the opposite. That's why I say you can't listen to what these guys say. You got to look at the record. You got to get the facts. And that's why I appreciate the work that you do. How do you convince people who may, including your state, either be complacent about the fact that they've got abortion protections in their state and they've got you as their governor or aren't in love with everything Joe Biden um, has been doing? How do you talk to them without minimizing what may be their valid concerns about the fact that the option if they don't vote for Donald, uh, if they don't vote for Joe Biden or they don't vote at all, is Donald Trump. Well, I, th I think it's by listening. You know, we got to earn people's votes. The vote is an important thing that someone has that, that only that person can exercise, and you got to earn that. I think it starts with listening. I think it, it extends to making sure people have the facts, you know, un putting it out there, what really is at stake in this election. You know, I got an organization, fightlikehell.org, if anyone wants to help, but this work that we're doing is, is centered around making sure that people understand just because we've made these great strides in Michigan, so proud of that, it can be undone quickly if we get a Trump term where he gets a legislature or a Congress that'll send him an abortion ban. Um, he's already said he's going to sign it. And that's why we can't let people assume that just because you're in a state that affords you these freedoms right now, that they're always going to be intact. They're, we're all at risk in this upcoming presidential election. What about the the movement that we saw, the uncommitted movement during the, the primaries? Those are people who, when presented with the idea that the binary choice between Donald Trump and, and uh, Joe Biden should be clear, have responded by saying, but that minimizes my actual concerns. That means that your things that you're worried about are not that important right now. What does listening to them or hearing them look like to you, specifically in Michigan? Because there are a lot of people who voted, came out to cast an uncommitted ballot. Yeah, there are a lot of people hurting. What is happening in, in Gaza and Israel, the hostages, as well as the innocent lives that are, are being lost every single day, it's, it's horrific. And here in Michigan, we've got a huge population that is often one degree of separation from, from people that are suffering or people that are mourning. It is horribly hard. And that's why I think showing up and listening, making sure that we stay focused on solving problems, keeping people safe here at home, and ensuring that they understand all the different things that we are working on to give people a path to a, a good life here, and to make sure that America is a credible force around the world, a force for good. But no voter is, no no group or community is monolithic. We got a lot of work to do, and that's that's just the very real truth. Governor Whitmer, good to see you again. Thank you for spending time with us this evening. Thank you. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.